Would you get my back? Would you take my call when I start to crack? Would you rescue me? Uh, would you rescue me when I'm by myself? When I need your love, if I need your help, would you rescue me? Uh, would you rescue me? Our world has never been in more danger. And that's especially true in the wilds of Africa. Over 11 million square miles of untamed wilderness, an ecosystem unlike anywhere else on the planet, where the effects of climate change, industrial development, and poaching are pushing the region to its tipping point. But there's still hope. Would you rescue me? Would you give my back? Would you take my car? When I start to crack, would you rescue me? Countering these unrelenting forces is a group of more than 200 civilian pilots and their aircraft. The world's most unusual all-volunteer peacetime air force, dedicated to protecting Africa's beloved wildlands and creatures from the sky. With support from wildlife management experts, researchers and environmentalists, they are the battlers and this is their mission. We've got a massive problem with conservation across the world, and especially here in Africa. We have an amazing crew of 200 pilots and aircraft that give up their time to put back into conservation. And with aircraft, we can do so much. Aerial surveys, anti-poaching, coastal river damage, demining. We've been doing this for 25 years now, and so much more work still needs to be done. Spread throughout the cities, towns, and private nature reserves of South Africa, the battlers are always nearby, on call, and ready to take flight, giving us a bird's eye view of one of the largest conservation opportunities on Earth, drawing on lessons from natural history as they work to secure our shared natural future. Bateliers provide a wonderful novel service by making available volunteer pilots with their aircraft to support us in a range of activities. The world needs us to stand up and be strong, now more than ever. There is no greater privilege than to work in a career where you feel that you're making a difference. I really love my job because it actually combines my two passions, conservation and flying. Our impact becomes so much greater when we take up to the skies. Fasten your seatbelts. This is Air Rescue Africa. A good place to start is where did the battliers begin? Who are the battliers? What do we do? So let me take you through that as quickly as I possibly can. Um, back in the day, a lot of you conservationists will all remember the controversy that surrounded the mining for, for titanium on the dunes of the KwaZulu-Natal North Coast in South Africa, uh, going north of Richards Bay. And these uh, dunes were mined by this uh, a, a big mining company that would just dredge into the mine, turn it upside down, pull the titanium out. And of course, there was the promise of the fact that behind them, they'd go and plant the rows of casserina trees rehabilitate the environment and everything would be great. Although it was the, the, the great conservationist, the late Dr. Ian Player, who established the fact that the, that the dunes have an extremely intricate structure of uh, capillary veins that run them where the water runs down. And I'll tell you how that happens very briefly. In this picture, you'll see in the foreground, the indigenous bush, the jungle that collects the, the early morning mist that comes off the ocean on the sea breeze every morning, those droplets get onto the leaves, drop into the sand, go down through the dune, and they create this aquifer structure, much like if you sprayed with a, a fine mist spray against a big plate glass window. Um, as a drop runs, it doesn't bounce off the next drop, it congregates with it and eventually becomes a trickle. And Dr. Player had observed that both the uh, Umfilosi and the Mkuzi rivers had dried up, there was no feed into the, into the Sundusia wetland, and yet the hippos and the crocodiles were congregating in their hundreds at various specific points, all of them on the western edges of those coastal dunes. And this is where it became evident that these aquifers were pouring fresh water for these, for these animals into the, into the wetland system. He needed to show that to the, to the conservationists. And it was the late Nora Crayer, the founder of the Batliers, who we uh, fondly nicknamed the Mother Teresa of aviation conservation. Long name, but nevertheless, Nora 
scrambled together a flight. Uh, Dr. Ian Player accompanied the flight and took with even the, the, the manager of the Richards Bay Mineral Mining Company, people from the Department of, of Environment in the government and so on. And with them seeing these animals, they realized that if you turn these dunes upside down, there would be deaths, not in the hundreds, but in the thousands of animals. And that little element of conservation gave rise to what is today the Isimangaliso Wetland Park, a World Heritage Site. Its name changed from the then St. Lucia Wetland. And of course, this eventuality, this, this great occurrence, had Nora motivated to now roll with the battliers, to develop this into a flying for the environment organization. And that is what it's become. We are 150 or more pilots as throughout South Africa and everybody flying for the, the environment on a voluntary basis, including the board of directors. Um, let me move on to the, the original founders of the organization. There on the left, you see an image of uh, the late, uh, 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 the old cosmetics mogul of South Africa, Avroy Schlein, who is our chairman to this day. Um, Avroy remains a pilot at age 80 something. I'm not allowed to tell you his, his age. Um, Dr. Ian Player can be seen in picture, and Dr. Keith Cooper, known to many conservationists throughout South Africa, and a current member who was one of our founding members, Paul Dutton. Um, and these fellows were the hardcore that got it all going. But let's move on. Um, perhaps a visual depiction of what the Battleers is all about and how we operate would be to, to walk in the shoes of a Battlier pilot. And whilst I could uh, depict almost anyone, I happen to have the imagery because I shot the photos myself. So this is not a, a Steve-centric delivery. It's all about the battliers. And here we see a day in the life of a battlier pilot. Starting with arriving on site, and there you see the, the luggage for the duration of the, of the mission that we're going to fly. And of course, always lots of camera equipment. Um, what I will do is with these slides, some of them are going to just talk about themselves. And I'm going to try and speed through it because we have lost some time. Um, so I'm going to move directly on to an easy part of some of the work that we do. I say easy, uh, easy for some, that is. Um, but flying transects in order to do uh, annual game census for wildlife management. This is very important. You know, people think, why do you want to count the animals? Well, there's a fine balance between what the environment can sustain in terms of numbers. And again, I don't go into the ecology of it. We merely provide the aviation service to the ecologist. They draw up these transects. We'd probably have shared with them a safe flying height. Let's say 500 foot would be a good one for having a, a good observation of the ground below. And if there's a mountain range um, or a ridge of, of hills in the, in the equation, then we run the lines parallel to that. You don't want to actually be opposing uh, the, the range of mountains because it makes a terrible loud bang when an airplane hits the hill. So uh, we now set up this set of transects probably with a 250 meter swathe either side for the people on the left and the right of the aircraft to do the counting, you'd then turn 500 meters on the next transect and off you go. And with it all being very meticulously planned, we set off on these things. And of course, there's an easy part to it. This image here shows the rhino in short grass, very easy to count, not unlike the elephant, very quick and easy to count. But then it starts getting interesting. For those of you viewing this image, you'd guess I would probably reckon 10 to 15 impala. And of course, even the antelope species need to be accounted for. Browsers and grazers, they're all different. They all impact differently on the environment. However, if we go and do a study of that image by zooming in, we found that there's actually 38 impala in that particular image. Um, those that are circled are there to be seen in the previous image, um, but very difficult to actually see them. And this is where photography and modern science and utilization of, of best technology comes into the game. The next image actually shows you a, a, a flock of flamingos in a wetland. Now, first of all, that's extremely difficult to just reach them. Um, if you were to reach them, it would be wading out there or on a boat. And then you're going to just have a sea of legs to look at, like trees in a forest. You'll never be able to count them. Whereas I can zoom on that image right there, and I'll tell you exactly, with 100% accuracy, how many flamingos. And why is that important? The health of the wetland determines whether the birds keep returning every year and whether they propagate in that environment. If there is pollution within the system, of course they don't. But again, I'm getting into conservation. That's not our business. Um, going into wetland areas, this, for example, is just inaccessible on foot or, or by vehicle. And this is where the aviation advantage really plays its part. We, we have to do this kind of work. Um, the technology with a camera, 
It's fantastic. Like your cell phone does, it uh, geotags where, wherever you shoot each image. The same thing happens with the modern DSLR cameras. So that picture of the Impala earlier on would be one of these little thumbnails here. And the ecologist can go and click on the thumbnail. He sees the picture. He gets the coordinates of where it was shot. And they're then able to start working out herd demographics and movements within the, the, the greater scheme of their game reserve. It's fantastic how it can all come together. Moving on from uh, a game count and uh, just that uh, element of aerial observation, we get to translocations or relocations of animals. And I can fly through this one quickly. The pictures will speak for themselves where um, humankind is fantastic. We, we, we are all urged and we seek to conserve. So we demarcate these wild areas, perhaps at great expense of relocating people that might have been resident in there. And the fences have to be put up at millions of rands worth of value, millions of dollars. Um, but of course, in doing that, we've now enclosed the animals. And what would be natural migratory movement is prohibited by way of the fences. And the lions in particular, they incline to breed pretty quickly. And of course, a coalition of two brother lions would uh, be the, the, the pride lions. And it doesn't take long before they're starting to take a look at their own daughters. And that's not something we want to have happening. So um, we've done it quite frequently. And in fact, we have one now in early February. We will take a coalition of two lion brothers, move them from one reserve, even into provincial, place them in another reserve and take from that reserve and bring them back to the original one, which is precisely what we're going to be doing in February. And that really is a quick way of sorting out the, the genetics um, and the problems with that. And there's no trading involved. It's a mutually agreed swap for the, for the greater good. Um, we've seen positive results pretty damn quickly. We move a, a, a coalition of two brother lines. And here we have the, the results within a year of uh, new cubs with new genetics. It's brilliant. And of course, moving on to the biggest of the animals, um, elephants have the same issues with the need to balance the, the genetics. Um, this particular image, and these photos were taken in the Tembi Elephant Park, where the great Tuskers live. And Tembi is, is possibly overstocked with elephant. They, they then gave two elephant uh, to a neighboring reserve. And you can't uh, bring in a team of helicopters with their uh, veterinarians and darts and ground crews with big cranes and four by four tractors and have, have everyone wait around for two weeks or more while everyone tries to search for the particular elephants in the sand forest jungles. So what they did was go in ahead um, and uh, with a light aircraft, very economical, we spot the elephants, they, they darted, a collar is put on them and then when the ground crews are ready, maybe a month or two later, they move on to site and within 20 minutes, those elephants are tracked via those collars they are darted and relocated. It's all very efficient and the least possible stress on the animal. Here we have the, the manager of the recipient reserve posing very proudly with one of the enormous Tembi Tuskers. And these animals went into the new reserve and of course they sought out all the young bullies and it's all a very, very beneficial program for all those involved. Um, also on relocations, um, everyone's familiar, I'm sure, with Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique um, Gorongosa is simply too far to start relocating animals on an easy basis. Um, if you were to take a leopard, for example, and put it into, your, into the back of your van or your bucky, as we call them, there'd be mayhem at the border post with everybody stopping to look at it. And it would take literally days to get through the bureaucracy of, of, of our border posts. Um, aviation is the way forward. And we have uh, successfully relocated many of the prime of the key apex predator species into Gorongosa that haven't been there for some 30 years. Of course, when Gorongosa stabilized after the war in Mozambique, the antelope species proliferated tremendously, but there were no predators. And they were flown in by the battliers. Um, the conservationists took care of where the animals came from, uh, whether they were suited for the transfer and so on. We merely did the flying, but it was a, a tremendous effort to be part of that whole deal. That pack basically doubled in size in the first year that they were there. Well, that just gives you an indication. Again, it's your intervention, your support that made that possible.
an interesting little aspect of relocations um, that we've uh, bumped into with doing the work that we do is that wild dogs are not uh, relocated just as an animal or two or pairs. Um, wild dogs form part of a, a very uh, complex structure within their family or their pack groups. Um, there's this hierarchical structure. So you can't take a young fella like we see on screen here, dump him in Gorongosa and hope for the best. He just won't survive it. Um, he needs the coaching. He needs the structure. So wild dogs are always relocated as entire packs or family groups. Um, our, our wildlife management people have got this down to an absolute fine art. It is, it is simply fantastic to see how they do the work and the speed and efficiency with which they do it with the absolute least stress possible for the animals. And yet now we have this Gorongosa where two relocations of uh, packs or families of wild dogs have resulted in what you saw there. They are breeding marvelously and they're in heaven there in, in Gorongosa. Moving on to endangered species, um, of course, uh, the likes of the pangolin certainly doesn't occur in families or packs. They're individual animals, and they are incredibly uh, threatened at the moment, um, hugely poached. Um, we have a situation where along the western boundary of the Kruger Park, um, they are poached routinely. Um, we don't uh, participate in the anti-poaching measures or the relocation or, 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 the, or the, uh, uh, the finding of these pangolins. That comes from intelligence done with those people, but we get called in when pangolins are found, and they're generally found in an extremely debilitated, emaciated condition where they need of care, and the badgers will then fly them through to the Johannesburg Veterinary Hospital, where they have the specialized equipment to take care of these animals. Of course, the poacher can't help the animal because they eat ants, and the poacher is not about to start feeding it. So the animal is restored back to, to fit health, and they are then relocated to a much safer environment where there is uh, no presence or knowledge of poaching of the pangolins, um, where it then at least has a, a hope of survival. And it was fascinating for me to, uh, uh, having been involved in the relocation um, and the, and the uh, pangolin coming back into one of these zones, to go and walk with them in the evening. Um, these pangolins are taken out late afternoon, early evening, because they are nocturnal, and they're taken to various zones until they find a place where they're happy with the ant diet that they can find. And there on the, on the side of that pangolin, you see the little uh, uh, item, little red thing dangling there. Well, quite simply, that is a light. It's a strobing light. Um, a little hole is drilled uh, painlessly through one of the, the, it's like a fingernail, you know, through one of the scales. And the little light is hung on there because in the night, the, the keeper who is looking after the, the re, uh, reintroduction to the wild of the pangolin, if he turns his back for a second and that camouflage in the dark, it just steps behind one rock and it's gone missing. So... They're able to follow it like that until eventually the pangolin is well settled after two to three weeks. And on one evening walk, you'll just unclip those lights, wave it goodbye, and there's another pangolin safely uh, returned to the wild and hopefully in a place where it's going to have a long life. Um, mining needs to clean up its act. It's as simple as that. And there is an absolute scourge within the mining environment they, they decimate the environment, and very sadly, mining licenses are issued, they rubber stamped, and as we all know, with the corruption and bribery that we can assume goes on, although uh, I mustn't make that a fact, but very sadly, when we come along as environmentalists afterwards and ask, uh, where's the rehabilitation? Because part of the mining license is the rehabilitation of the environment after the mining, and that very seldom occurs. Um, it's probably the person who took some money under the table and stamped the mining license who's supposed to take charge of the rehabilitation, but they now compromise and they can't do that. So we make use of the media. I say we, uh, we, we provide them with the support. And in fact, in 2022, we flew uh, Derek Watts of Carte Blanche and we've flown uh, in media of that level on numerous occasions and they have a loud voice and we love that. Um, a battlier pilot shouting from the hilltops about something he's seen on the ground is not going to be heard, but bring in the big guns in the media and action happens. And we've seen many a, a reversal on these uh, degraded mining areas occurring thanks to the media. Uh, marine animals, um, of course, they are equally important as the land animals, but they are seldom seen. They live in the ocean. Everyone is seemingly somewhat detached from, from marine animals because of that lack of, of contact but they are a very, very important part of our conservation and, and, and environment. Um, seals um, are something we deal with quite regularly. 
Um, they seemingly chase the annual sardine run up the KwaZulu Natal north coast. They then become disoriented. I don't know whether all that chasing of, of sardines uh, makes their compass go tilt, but they land up stranded on beaches on the KwaZulu Natal coast along with penguins. And the, the, the fantastic public rescue these animals, take them to Sambra that we heard about a little uh, a moment earlier on, um, who restore them to good health. And the battliers then fly them back down south to their natural uh, home ground and where they are released. Look at that, a, a little clawless otter. And as the caption says, who wouldn't want to save that? It's as cute as anything. It's uh, one of our directors, Raymond Stain, who's put an enormous amount of, of his own goodwill into the battliers and, and making these flights. We have uh, transported a lot of penguins. We've in fact had one of our directors in the due diligence applied to, to uh, whether we accept a mission and do the flight or not. He basically turned around and said he's not exactly in favor of executive transport for penguins. That's a great way of putting it. Uh, you know, a Learjet for a penguin. It's going to be the world's most expensive penguin ticket ever issued. And Dr. Judy Mann, one of our directors, turned around and said, no, the African penguin, in fact, is in lesser numbers than the rhino and is at greater risk based on their breeding rate of extinction than what the rhino is. Yet nobody pays this attention because it's not one of the in vogue species. Be that as it may, Judy basically concluded the statement with the fact that every penguin counts. And of course, the penguin was duly moved. We've also had coastal uh, fishing impact studies that we've supported. Um, Oceanographic Research Institute have flown uh, once every five years for a set period or a program where they'll fly on the worst day possible, a drizzly day in the middle of the week, uh, low impact on fishermen, to a public holiday, for example, in the sunshine, where every bit of rock and surf in the piers are full of fishermen. And they then gauge with this survey how much uh, what tonnage of rock and surf angling has occurred and of fish being removed from the ocean. And that is the intertidal breeding zone. It is an, an extremely important area. So understanding this becomes critical to, to the conservation of these, of these fish species in the marine life. And without the aviation element, they're just not going to be able to do the study. So we've been very happy to be able to have supported this particular study. There's some benefits to be had as well. Flying home at the end of one of these things is a little bit of onboard catering and some good banter that goes on. Here's a little brief touch on uh, technology and how we work with that as well. Is uh, The Wattle Crane Project has been an absolutely fantastic project where it was on record some years ago that there were only 63 breeding pairs of wattle crane, cranes left in the world. It, it was on the absolute most red list you could ever imagine. It was in dire straits and at, at risk of extinction. Um, it was discovered that, of course, the breeding sites are all in wetlands in, in, the, in the sort of middle uh, elevation areas, not on the top of the Drakensberg Mountains, but certainly not coastal. So they were in that Midlands area. Um, that is a forested area. And of course, with the, with the uh, proliferation of forests, they dry up the groundwater and a lot of wetlands on the longer wetlands because of commercial uh, afforestation. And this is what brought the wattle cranes under threat. We were given a list uh, in an Excel spreadsheet in an email of all the known nesting sites as coordinates. And it's just fantastic how the technology works. We took that list, converted it into the uh, navigation program for our, our uh, GPSs, then uploaded by wire to the GPS having created the most economical route possible to get around this, this region and to go and count all of the wattle crane uh, uh, nests. And of course, this is done in the breeding season. And there is uh, Tanya Smith, the uh, uh, a person from the EWT and Nature Wildlife Trust. And when I was first called and told you were going to go count birds' eggs from the sky, I thought this was a wackhead Simpson prank call that was coming to me. I laughed. I said, it can't be done. You want to count birds' eggs from an aeroplane but it was absolutely perfectly doable. You go past these nests, they are easy to be seen because a crane uses its long legs to rake all the, the reeds together. In creating the dry mound on which it'll have its nest, it's also created a moat and that prevents the predators from reaching the eggs. So you fly past it and you're absolutely easy to see from the, the air whether there's one or two eggs. Most nests have two eggs. Uh, Tanya then goes along afterwards um, she gets dressed up in her in her waders and she weighs the eggs, the heavier one being the, the first one laid usually. She'll then harvest the other one 
and they go to a specialist incubation uh, uh, rearing facility at the Johannesburg Zoo, at the, at the uh, crane, the Waddle Crane program. And you would have all seen those programs of humans dressed in a funny outfit looking like a stork so that the, 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 the crane doesn't imprint on the human. Nevertheless, once they've been reared, they're taken back into the region and released. And believe it or not, it's the, the wattle crane has come off the red list. They are now uh, proliferating beautifully and, and, and growing rapidly. So the program continues just as a precaution, but that was a marvelous movement. Um, very similar to that is the red billed oxpecker. And here I'm going to allow a little video to do some of the talking for me, but uh, we were very instrumental in bringing the red billed oxpecker, oxpecker back from the brink. a number of missions in terms of our Operation Oxpecker where you were instrumental in translocating batches of red billed oxpeckers. In 2015, the red billed oxpecker was delisted as a threatened species and removed in any sense, and it was declassified to least concern as a species in South Africa. There you have it from Andre Boerter, a famous conservationist with the Endangered Wildlife Trust. Um, education is something we get very involved in as well. Um, I'm just checking the time here. I'm going to have to fly through these next few. Um, we've done some tremendous education programs, taking youngsters uh, who have been on a conservation program in the region. We then fly them through that region. And we are told that afterwards, when they get back to their schools and are asked to write an essay or do a project on what they learned in conservation, the flying element of it was the absolute highlight. They all speak about the flying. So it's beautiful that we can imprint on these people and give them the knowledge of, of the benefit of aviation and conservation. Rhino poaching is a terrible scourge. Um, these slides, you don't want to see them, um, but it's been taken very ser seriously by the authorities. It's treated as a priority crime, um, and we've had involvement in that as well. And then, of course, a, an upshot of that is to go on anti-rhino uh, or, or rhino anti-poaching programs by dehorning. It is absolutely terrible that this iconic animal has its horn removed. That's what it's famous for. And that's what so many logos have been made from, the silhouette of that rhino with its horn. But which poacher would go into big five territory, maybe at night, at risk of uh, uh, a, a contact with the anti-poaching unit, all for finding a rhino which has no horn? And as a direct result of this type of program, we have actually seen a decline. And last year was the first year in many where there has been a decline in the in the rhino uh, poaching so we hope to be able to continue supporting these fantastic teams in that endeavor that uh, image there just shows the breadcrumb trail off the gps of one of these uh, rhino anti-poaching and and dehorning operations it was a lot of territory covered um, and there's some stats from it i'm not going to take you through that now of course, we have a lot of fun while we're out on the work as well. It's not just all work, work, work. We try and make it as light as we can. And some marvelous imagery comes out of the deal. Here we have a, a picture of an elephant, a Zulu and elephant, who, who are very disciplined. They've been well trained. We've yet to see one exceed the 50 kilometers an hour as seen on the sign there. The little chameleon chain. We rode over the top of him uh, unbeknownly. saw him at the last minute with a vehicle. And I wanted a picture of it, so I stopped the drive, went back with a camera, and here's this poor little fella absolutely transfixed there. He was immobilized by the shock. Anyway, I picked him up, put him in the bush, and we carried on in our journey. Um, this little series of slides tells an interesting story of uh, the executives coming into Pinder Game Reserve in Zuland um, won't use a runway or an airfield that doesn't have services of uh, air traffic control, fire services. So... The local fire brigade is hired. Who pays who and how they arrange that is uh, interesting, but I'm not going to go into that now. And I'd been working there for a month on anti-poaching patrol, and my little aircraft had turned pink because of that red sand that you see there. So one good turn deserves another, and the fire brigade gave my little plane a, a good hosing down. And at the end of any project, of course, a clearance from the local air traffic controllers and flying home What's not to like about flying through the Inflosinga plantations of Zululand in the early morning mist and heading back home again? It's just absolutely brilliant. Um, rounding off, uh, if there are any aviators in the group um, or anyone here who knows of, of pilots who want to fly or, or join us, how do they do that? Well, we've got pilots spread throughout the country, but we need more all the time. 
And there's a little graph of the spread throughout the country. It, it is fairly uh, uh, evenly distributed, but we'd beg of any pilots, if you're tired of going to the neighboring airfield for the 20th time for that uh, next cup of coffee, rather come and fly with us, fly for a purpose and have the, the, the great satisfaction of having done something meaningful at the end of your flight. Um, you simply go onto the website, there's a fly for us button. It's an easy online process, fill in the forms and we'll take care of the rest. There are, of course, T's and C's apply as always, but you'll read all about it on that web. Conservationists, that's most of the people here this evening. Um, if we can benefit anyone in conservation or support your, your, your mission, again, go on the site, link up to the uh, uh, how to request a flight and there is a process that we go through in order to, to qualify each flight. Um, one of the biggest ones, of course, is that we were purely and only of donor funding. And we can't take the donor's rand or dollar that they've given to us for the greater good of conservation and provide it towards some entrepreneur for the betterment of their commercial business that they're putting together. So it has to really be for the greater good of conservation by, by legit organizations. Um, and then, then we'll allow the flight to go ahead. Um, how can you support us? Well, uh, we have a button on the site that simply says uh, donate, and that would be fantastic if you're able to do that. Um, and of course, we have a situation where our pilots are the greatest contributors to the bad years of anyone because they give up of their time in their aircraft. Um, let's say it amounts to 4,000 rand an hour of the running cost of an aircraft. Only 1,000 of that will be the fuel which we place on site. So this pilot comes along and instead of going for his uh, 20th cup of coffee that I mentioned earlier on, he will come along and do that flight for the greater good because he's passionate about the conservation, but the other 3,000 Rand after the fuel has been provided is coming from the pilot. And I don't know of another NGO where you could say, give us $1,000 or 1,000 Rand and we'll turn that into three or 4,000 Rands or dollars worth of direct contribution towards conservation. Most others, I'm afraid, are the outstretched hand that uh, where the money might disappear, you know, without account. So we really do have a, an exceptional circumstance in that regard. A very easy way to do it, if you're not a wealthy philanthropist or corporate, please just use your, your Woolworths Woolie, Woolie, card. Um, if you go into the Woolworths website, you can choose the My Planet program and nominate the, the Batliers as your beneficiary. And that might not seem a lot on one little shopping outing for two or 300 Rand. But if you're spending 2,000 Rand a month and there's 1,000 people doing it, that becomes meaningful. And we'll be able to keep these flats and this contribution to conservation going. Um, we also like to have associations. Maybe a person isn't able to contribute directly with a, a cash contribution. We see there on the left, for example, is our fast weight courier, our preferred courier provider, where they said to us, we're not in a position to support you with a direct financial contribution, but we've got trucks crisscrossing the country every day. Give us your parcels and your pilot care packages, which we give to our special pilots, and we'll transport that for you. So there's a classic case of, a, of an association where we give them great credit every time they do that on our social media and vice versa. So if you're in a position to support the bad leaders in that sort of way, please come and chat to us. We are Section 18A uh, uh, registered, so all in any contributions, be they in cash or in kind, are able to be uh, supported with a Section 18A tax deductible receipt. That's it. I'm done. Thank you very much for allowing me the platform. I really appreciate that Screen Share Africa has allowed me to be here for the introductions, Johan and Chris and uh, Marit, for your fantastic IT skills in making it all come together. Um, in closing, the last thing that I want to do before we go to the Q&A session is to say, please share our story. I ask that more than anything else. Every one of you listening here this evening is either a conservationist or knows of some pilots or knows of somebody who'd wish to support us. Share the story, please. Thanks very much, folks. Steve, on behalf of the audience here, I would like to thank you for your uh, presentation this evening. Um, it was an absolute pleasure working with you. Um, mostly, I would like to thank you for being a lesson in efficiency. In South Africa at this moment, I think we can all look at ourselves and say, we have some trouble with efficiency, but your organization is an, is an wonderful conservation example of how, you, how to be efficient. It's a, it, tonight was a lesson in project management. You take a little bit, and you make a lot with it and you and you created something out of a small seed 
it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful experience to, to, to see a plan work out like that. And also welcome to all the other directors um, like Judy Mann of, uh, of the Bataliers that are in the, in the audience this evening. You are most welcome. Um, it shows that where enthusiasm and dedication is present, you can achieve a lot. You can make up for the lack of finances. Um, hard work makes up for a lot. Um, Steve, you are a true ambassador for your profession as well as your organization, the Battlers, and may you keep on flying for many, many years. Um, I would like to welcome everybody now to the Q&A session. Um, you're welcome to use the uh, reaction tools at the bottom to attract our attention, or you can, if you're a bit shy, you're welcome to um, uh, type in the chat and we will pay attention to that as well. Thank you, Johan. I summarized Steve's talk in three words. Passion, professional, professional, and precision. Very impressed. Thank you, Steve. Let me ask if uh, fellow director Donovan Bailey will unmute himself. Um, it'll be great if Donovan can uh, stand with me, not in front of camera, but uh, at least uh, is supporting and answering some of the Q&A. Uh, Donovan's been around the block plenty, and as a fellow director, he knows the story every bit as well as what I do. All right, Steve, I'm here holding your hand. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Okay. Donovan. Uh, show yourself. Come on. Come in and show yourself. <laughs> oh, you. Thank you. Now we can As see you can see, I'm a young, not younger than Steve. Yeah, clearly. Absolutely clearly. Yeah. Just more flying hours, but much, much younger. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Any comments? Marty, you're still welcome to ask questions, eh? even even though you will be presenting soon. <laughs> Marty wants no, to know. It, it's, a, it's a question, but not really challenging. So I was just wondering if you have any helicopter pilots as part of your battalion's crew, um, or is it all fixed wing aircraft? Um, Marty, it is a, a mix, basically on the same demographics as what we have on the, on the whole of the South African aircraft register. Um, you will likely have seen just on casual observation that maybe for every 10 fixed wing aircraft that you see, you'll see one helicopter. And that's about the same ratio within the battalions. So yes, we do have the helicopter pilots. Um, and there has been a tremendous transition in recent years with the advent of light sport aircraft. These are small two-seater aircraft. They, they fly at a very low or contained speed and they run on the same 95 unleaded that you'd use in your motor vehicle. So they're extremely economical. And we are trying wherever possible to convert our users, if I could uh, respectfully call our conservationists that, into making use of the light sport aircraft. It'll just stretch our donor funding that much further, allowing us to do that much more work. Because even the smallest uh, little Robinson four-seater helicopter today runs at around about 7,000 Rand an hour. Whereas the light sport aircraft, you'd get a bit of change from 2,000 Rand an hour. So you can figure the math for yourself. And I mean, Steve, I see you've got a, a talk coming up about vultures. We've got a Tokis a helicopter pilot, literally went and spent a month in Mozambique helping with the counter vultures, which massive cost to himself, but he did it and fully committed and went up to Mozambique and, and counter vultures for us. Wow, mm. amazing. Fantastic. Please invite him to come in next week. It would be, it would be fascinating to also hear his uh, contribution. We'll I'll definitely try for that. I saw a comment earlier of what are the entry criteria for pilots. Yes. To answer that one very quickly, and I'm not going to go into great detail, um, a commercial pilot in South Africa requires 200 hours in order to start flying commercially. We require the same hours. So we, we unfortunately won't take a wet behind the ears new pilot, however enthusiastic they may be, when that uh, ink on the rubber stamp is still wet. So we require that same standard of 200 hours. And even then, those pilots, um, we, we constrain them, if I could put it that way, because they're so enthusiastic. <laughs> but they will only do Lone Ranger transport flights. We don't allow them to travel with uh, people or personnel, a veterinarian, for example. But then once you have 400 hours of service, uh, of total flying time, then the battaliers will engage you in uh, anti-poaching patrols, uh, dehorning operations. You know, to go in hot weather like we've had in Zululand this last week or two, and to be orbiting around a tree, trying to chase a rhino out from under there to, to put a dart in them, 
that takes some very, very uh, skillful flying. So we do have those levels and it's for a good reason. And we've never lost anybody or any passengers in our 25 years. So we're proud of our standards and we're keeping them there. Congratulations on that as well. Um, Steve, could you um, perhaps say, uh, sorry, Chris? Just want to mention in the chat, Judy Mann, there are so many ways for conservationists to use the batteries. If you're unsure of, uh, of it, uh, if your project would qualify or not, ask Steve. Uh, and if it works, we will try. So just to mention that. Chris, well, if I can maybe ask Steve on that comment, would you like to say a little bit more on the um, qualifications for a project or how a project qualifies for, for a flight? Yes, Johan, uh, I'll reiterate right away that it cannot be for any individual or organization's commercial gain, as mentioned earlier. Our donors do not give up their hard-earned funding uh, uh, to support the battliers for somebody else's uh, commercial benefit. So that's the first criteria. We then vet the organization that's made the application, whether it be an individual doing a PhD study, and we have had that. Um, a couple of years ago, Don himself uh, flew for a student doing his PhD studies on crocodiles. And of course, Issy Mangalisa was the, was the venue. So there was a, a lone ranger, not part of an organization, but the, the aviation was integral and vital to him establishing the statistics that he did, which have become extremely useful in, in crocodile conservation. So we, we simply study each application to make sure that it is legit and that the organization is credible. Um, no ways ever would we transport lion cubs that are going to some canned hunting farm, perish the thought, and I can see people rolling their eyes back, but we just wouldn't go there. And we have to remain credible in that regard and squeaky clean, otherwise our donor funding, I'm certain, will dry up in a heartbeat the moment we are seen to be in the wrong place. But I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. If I may, I mean, we have things from a request in the Cape looking for nearly an extinct uh, dung beetle to a shrew in the mountains in the Cape. So it's just the diversity of it is anything, anything to do with conservation. The more diverse it is, the more excited we get, to be honest. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you. Curious to know what was one of your most unique projects? I think, Steve, if I may, we recently had a, um, the cradle of humankind up in Johannesburg. They've had a problem with their jackal getting rabies, and then they're obviously biting other animals, and there's a story going that a honey badger bit someone and, and they sadly passed away. So a vet a professor at Unistaport has come up with, a, I think it's a fish meal pellet with a, a tablet inside it. And they wanted to drop them in grids because the only alternative was going to go and shoot out all the jackal. So, you know, that thing, it's absolute curveball because you have to fly on a World Heritage site in restricted airspace, dropping low level pellets along a grid. And that we're waiting for the results. It'll take about a year for them to find out how successful that was. But again, that thing we never done before came, you know, got asked and yeah, we, we grabbed it and went with it. Lovely. I love your, you know, the point is you also have a passion for flying, don't make a mistake. And challenges like that is wonderful challenges also for a pilot, you know, that's, yeah. I think it's amazing that you are using your passion uh, to also for your second passion, which one is first, uh, conservation or flying, but it's wonderful. Well, I can, I can share with you that uh, on that flight, our pilot was a certain Thomas Merrow who's uh, quite a well-known videographer, a uh, 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 blogger in aviation, and Professor Katja Kuppel from uh, Onustaput, who called for the mission, wanted a spread of X amount of these uh, baits, these, these uh, uh, tablets that were going to be dropped. And she didn't quite know how to work that out, so she just gave the data to Thomas. Thomas then made a study of his aircraft's forward flying speed, the mm. sway that he would cover between each transect and how many pellets she had and, and required them to have an even distribution. And would you believe on the uh, having flown some 40 odd transects through the cradle of humankind, they were halfway through the last line when they ran out of pellets. He calculated it to perfection. It was fantastic. Wow. Fantastic, wonderful, wonderful. Anybody else who would like to come in? I see this uh, Gupo. Uh, Bakchu. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It looks like I'm, uh, I'm not certain if you have raised your hand or not. 
Gubal? Yeah, <clears throat> no, I'm just joined uh, out of interest today, uh, first time, just to see what you guys are all about, really. All right, lovely to have you on. Spent, uh, spent most of my time in Africa, so I just wanted to see some Africa again. <laughs> Wonderful. Beautiful photo, yeah. Very beautiful presentation, Steve. Brought back the days when, uh, you know, we were in all those uh, parks in Zambia and uh, Tanzania, where I was uh, actually born in Kenya. So, yeah. Wonderful. And thanks for joining us. And I agree with you. Very professional uh, presentation uh, by Steve. And the... just, just, yeah, sorry, just an observation, yeah, no, if I may, yeah. while, while there aren't many questions. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we, we've actually recently, uh, uh, with the um, work that I'm involved with, they've actually done um, a full topographical survey scan using drones. And obviously, that makes it a lot less expensive. I was wondering whether the battliers have also got any drone pilots um, amongst the rank and whether that's a possibility to, to add, because obviously, as you've mentioned, flying is uh, rather expensive, uh, 2,000, I think it was rand an hour, um, whereas drone pilots can be quite an efficient way, not to sort of kill the, the joy of flying. I was just wondering. Yes, certainly, Marty. Um... Drone pilots, and I'm one of them, by the way, when I'm not flying a regular aircraft, get a tremendous joy out of flying their drones and also making that, that contribution to, to the greater good. Um, so, yes, certainly it is something that has arisen. Of course, it was inevitable. And as of last year, we recruited, uh, well, they came to us um, as uh, applicants to join the battalion. So we now have two drone pilots as licensed drone pilots within our, our squadron of the environmental air force as we call ourselves and uh, undoubtedly that is going to grow um, in exactly which spheres and facets of conservation we're going to be able to get benefit from them that will evolve as we work with them but yes we, we're doing that cool i'll share your details with a couple of drone pilots that i know who did those uh, topographical surveys for us and hopefully they um their hearts in the right place thank you talk about heart in the right place uh, the way we target a pilot, and I say that uh, as if we're the rabbit dog that Don was talking about, but you know that kind of uh, pilot when he's going to go on his annual leave, he goes to Kruger Park and grabs his binoculars to go bird watching. That's the pilot we want in the battle years because his heart, as you just put it there now, is in the right place. He's got a passion for conservation and the environment and nature, and yet uh, once that flying's in your blood, it's there. And that, that type of pilot is just the absolute perfect pilot that we need now in our squadron. So if you have a squiz, you have a squiz in my background, uh, um, I'm just sharing one of the videos of a highlight of my life when I um, flew through the Kruger Park with one of the regional rangers um, <clears throat> doing transects, uh, looking for poached rhinos. So uh, that was just a thing I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, the, the, the guys now like to share a topical video or picture while, while the talk's going on. <laughs> Fantastic. I did see the rotor blades. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. Um, Chris, I just want like to refer to the question by Kevin Barrett. Uh, requirements for a pilot, would that be 200 hours plus and the CPL or not? Anything else you would like to add to that? Uh, Johan, no, the CPL is not necessary. Um, we'll take a paraglider pilot, national pilot's license, which is a uh, a bit of a misnomer in terms of the name, that's for light sport aircraft, the ones I was mentioning earlier, the, the smaller two-seat aircraft. Uh, the pilot does not have to be a commercial pilot, but we have the, that entry standard of a minimum 200 hours to come in and do the, the, the non-challenging work, and then 400 hours if it's going to be challenging work. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Yuan. Missing any I'm questions. Sure going through the chat, I don't see any other questions. I don't see any other hands. Um, Steve Donovan and whole team. Um, I can tell you that this is a, uh, this is a lovely, lovely way of infusing all of us to do something. You know, that's the wonderful part for me is that. Um, um, we tend to think a conservationist must hold some other degree, uh, BSc or uh, higher diploma in conservation. And each of us 
in our own way are conservationists and we could just use our normal day-to-day -day skills to make a difference. It is really fascinating. Thank you so much. And I see in the chat so many people just congratulate you on a, on a great presentation. I want to check, uh, sorry, my camera is giving problems. Just want to check if there's a last, anybody who would like to ask a question or make a comment. Um, right. Just to reiterate and Judy Mann's uh, uh, comment there, it's also another great start to 2023, this presentation. Thank you very yeah. much. Yes, and very professional. Thank you, I must say. Uh, really, really also, we also, amongst the many things we want to do this year, we also want to raise our standards and do things as professional as we can. But thanks to all of you. We wish you a lovely evening and a good morning of, to those of you on the other side of the uh, globe. And uh, lovely to see you all. And we hope to see you next week again. Johan, anything last word from your side? And thanks to Zolda. Happy to see you. Andy Klee, all the way from the UK. I know it's cold. Lovely to see you, Andy. It's good to see Andy's comment, uh, calling the uh, Unlocking Nature the weekly dose of hope. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Wonderful to have you. Yeah, well, maybe Andy, you can get us a, a, a pilot and a, an airplane there on your side and send him this way for a while. Come and help. All right. Oh, well, I'll, I'll try. My neighbor over the fence used to be one of the RAF's top helicopter instructors, and he was Prince William's, you know, co chair when he was doing his air sea rescue off Anglesey. So, um, you know, I'll see what I can do. Maybe, we'll just maybe in house. Put him himself. All right. <laughs> thank you everybody have yep, a good cheers. night and a good day thank you thank you Johan and Maret for all your help and again Steve well done thank you like Maretka says well done <laughs> thank you cheers,